M S W Media. Season four of How We Win is here. For the past four years, we've been making history in critical elections all over the country. And last year, we made history again by expanding our majority in the Senate, eating election denying Republicans in crucial state house races, and fighting back a non existent red wave. But the MAGA Republicans who plotted and pardoned the attempted overthrow of our government now control the House, thanks to gerrymandered maps and repressive anti voter laws. And the chaotic spectacle we've already seen shows us just how far they will go to seize power, dismantle our government, and take away our freedoms. So the official podcast of The Persistence is back with season four. There's so much more important work ahead of us to fight for equity, justice, and our very democracy itself. We'll take you behind the lines and inside the rooms where it happens with strategy and inspiration from progressive changemakers all over the country. And we'll dig deep into the weekly news that matters most and what you can do about it with messaging and communications expert, co-founder of Way to Win, and our new co-host, Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. So join Steve and I every Wednesday for your weekly dose of inspiration, action, and hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. And And this this is is How How We Win. Win. is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 41 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It is Wednesday, October 27th. I'm your co-host, Andrew Torres. I am back from vacation, and I promise never to leave you again. Uh, but earning a well-deserved break today is Allison Gill. So filling in for her is the one and only. Uh, if you're not excited to see her, it's probably because you're opposing counsel. Hi, CJ. It's Morgan Stringer. Oh, I am not getting on a phone call. Also, I really appreciate it. The script has a joke that literally three people in the world are going to find funny. (laughs) But, you know, you know, what's not funny are amazing patrons who help make the show possible by going to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod and signing up for as little as one dollar an episode. You get a shout out on the show and you get an ad free feed. Yeah, and we've been a little late in doing the monthly hangout thing because, you know, I was traveling. Uh, But I promise you that is also coming. Those have been great. We've done trivia. We've just, you know, hung around for hours. It's been a lot of fun. Um, That's uh, that's on its way if you're a patron. And this week, we particularly love Anthony Schmidt, Chess Peaceface, and Kristen Leist. Yes, we do. Chess Peace Face in particular sounds like a tick villain. So uh, if you'd like to join their ranks, sign up, throw us a buck, show us you love us first, and then we'll love you back. We promise. And uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's get on to the A block for our lead story. We're going to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, Joe Manchin. Well, actually, two elephants in the room, Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. And, and so I want to say this first, right? It's a function of basic math that the further to the left the swing vote is, the better the outcomes are likely to be, even if you're sorting among bad choices, right? Like, think about the the Supreme Court, right? It it mostly sucked with the idiosyncratic but largely conservative Anthony Kennedy uh, as the swing vote. It got way worse when doctrinaire conservative institutionalist John Roberts became the swing vote. And then, of course, it got 
way worse than that when RBG died and was literally replaced with Serena Joy from The Handmaid's Tale. I get it. The problem is that Mansion and Cinema are swing votes, and they're way to the right of the rest of the entire Senate. They're what the Republican Party would be if Mitt Romney had won. And so yep. the key is to elect more Democratic senators so that we can handle a couple of defections and still win votes. And the flip side is that this can get way worse. If we lose a single Senate seat, then that 50th vote moves from Joe Manchin, who is terrible, to Susan Collins, who is even more terrible and literally <laughs> yeah. aided and abetted the entire corrupt Trump presidency and at most would uh, raise an eyebrow and say, <laughs> I am concerned. Which means, I don't care. So if we lose three seats in the midterms, the 50th vote will be Mitt Romney. You know, uh, swing voter Mitt Romney. The literal Republican <laughs> presidential candidate from a decade ago. Yeah, so get to electing more Democrats and, and get to primarying Kirsten Cinema. I continue to say, this has been my stance, it's my pin tweet for a reason. If you give me mm -hmm. a case of Chardonnay and a carton of Camel Blues and you lock us together in a room, I can fix Kirsten Cinema. So uh, um, I know it. <laughs> if Joe Biden is listening, then, you know, that's an option. But the case for primarying her did get a lot stronger this week when we learned via investigative reporting at Mother Jones that as she's come under fire for obstructing the Democratic agenda, Cinema has turned to some big name Republicans as donors. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's dig into this. Right. Um, we, we just had the quarterly reports due and uh, for July through September, the end of September, cinema raised one point one million dollars, um, which, by, by the way, a um, roughly what she raised in the previous quarter, not a ton of money. Right. Her burn rate is really high. Her war chest is only a couple of million dollars. So, again, this is not somebody who can't be beaten in a primary. Right. Get in there. Anyway. Um, so uh, she had to disclose that it wasn't that there was a big chunk of money that's that 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 stood out. Right. It's not like she's being flooded with right wing money. It's rather that as liberal groups are defecting, openly criticizing uh, she has turned to conservative sources uh, to try and fill that fundraising gap. And in particular, it's her list of max donors. Right. Like when you when you donate in your individual name, um, you can only give it is now twenty nine hundred dollars per election. And then there's, you know, a, a primary and a, and a general. So fifty eight hundred dollars every two years. Um, looking at who's writing those twenty nine hundred dollar checks uh, has Raise some eyebrows, so to speak. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Cinema's recent donors include Stan Hubbard, a Minnesota billionaire who has funded Republicans since 2000, including Scott Walker's 2016 presidential campaign Ugh. and a pro Trump super PAC. So, yikes. He wrote Cinema a $2,900 check on September 29th. Jimmy Hoslam, who owns both the Cleveland Browns of the NFL and those garbage truck stops called Pilot you see on I 95, which, you know, It'll get it done in a pinch. That guy and his <laughs> wife each gave Cinema's campaign $2,900 on September 30th. You might remember Halsam at Haslam as one of the key funders to Mitch McConnell's Senate Leadership Fund. Their goal is, as you might suspect, for Republicans to retake the Senate. Shocker. Yeah, uh, more garbage monsters are weighing in, including hedge fund billionaires Mark Rowand and Anthony DiNicola. Um, ultimately, uh, Politico uh, built on this Mother Jones reporting. They combed through all of cinema's fundraising. They found that 90 percent of the money that she's raised comes from outside of Arizona. That is people who are not her constituents. And look, that's what that means, right? Republicans realize that she is to the right of the Arizona electorate, that a strong Democrat could unseat her in the primaries and still win the general election. And so they're hedging their bets by backing a roadblock. Right. So, Morgan, I'm going to tell you the person that I think is key to cracking that roadblock. And it's not you, the Chardonnay and the Camels, although that would be my first choice. It is, in fact, my good friend, Joe Manchin. I hate you. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, I know. Hear me out, though. Look, it is super easy and correct to hate Joe Manchin, right? Like, he is an out-of-touch mainstream Republican who has a D after his name because reasons. Look, I spent most of 2000s, right, hating Joe Lieberman, and Joe Lieberman was never as conservative as Joe Manchin, right? I, I, I get it, I get it. 
But I also get that Manchin comes from a state that supported Trump by 39 points in the last election. That's literally 69 to 30, right? West Virginia wasn't just a conservative pro-Trump state. Like, it was the second most pro-Trump state in the country, just edging out Wyoming, right? Joe Biden did better in North Dakota, in Oklahoma, Idaho, in Kentucky than he did in, in, in West Virginia. He did twice as well in Utah than he did in, in West Virginia, right? So uh, uh, my position is you get rid of Joe Manchin and West Virginia is, I don't know, they're going to send a Senator Ted Nugent or something. Yeah, I get it. But also counterpoint, Joe Manchin is up for re-election in 2024. And if that's anything like 2020, a grand total of zero Democrats won in Senate races where the state voted for Trump at the top of the ticket. That means unless a lot changes very quickly in the next year or so, Manchin is going to get crushed by Ted Nugent no matter what happens. But then again, like you said, you know, he's been in office for a very long time. So I think it is kind of just on honorary D after his name and everybody knows the deal. So he did win re-election in 2018, a very strong Democratic year by a point and a half over a Republican you can't even name. But as we established, you know, it, Trump absolutely destroyed West Virginia. So um, yeah. I had to look it up and he ran against some guy named Patrick Morrissey. And no, it is not that Morrissey, not the musician. So none of this public posturing, though, is going to help him win re-election anyway. So why not just actually do some good for the country? Like Doug Jones, he never would do this. I uh, it, I, it, Doug Jones is a really, really strong counterpoint. I, it, 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 I, I concede on that. Here's my wager to you. This is just beans, right? In the end, I think Manchin is going to deliver most of the Biden agenda during reconciliation. And I think because of all of his public posturing, as you put it, I really well put it, um, that that's going to force Kirsten Cinema along for the ride, right? She is not going to vote against a reconciliation bill that Joe Manchin publicly says he's going to support. Um, by the way, uh, just quick numbers. So far, according to the 538 tracker, Manchin has voted the, the Biden way, voted with the Biden agenda 37 times out of 37 so far. 100 percent a perfect record, according to 530. And that's, you know, 37 votes of of real consequence. So I think Manchin likes being the center of attention. At the end of the day, I think he's going to give us far more of what we want than people are feeling right now. So let's um, let's throw some numbers out there and uh, maybe we'll make some friendly wagers. Right. Um, CNN is reporting right now that Manchin is drawing the line at one point five trillion in new spending and reconciliation. Right. Democrats want three point five. Right. Uh, when you add in the one point two trillion in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, that gives you. The the mansion stated position as two point seven trillion when Democrats want four point seven trillion. That's a little better than half. So first wager, I think at the end of the day, whatever bill comes through reconciliation is going to have more than one point five trillion in new spending in in that process. Democrats are going to get more than Manchin is saying he's holding the line at right now. I still don't think that's a win, but I also <laughs> am still going to take the under. I, d d fair. D talk to me a little bit about why you don't think that's a win. I just, I mean, the numbers are so arbitrary, right? And it's it's just like, I'm sorry, Joe Manchin, that, that's what things cost. You know, it's these, for throwing out these arbitrary numbers, and Kirsten Cinema also reminds me of this, it's like, Negotiating with Kirsten Cinema, I feel like is much more akin to negotiating with the Joker because you truly have no idea what the <laughs> hell she wants, right? She's just like, I don't know why it has to be, you know, one trillion instead of four trillion, you know, it's like no explanation, nothing. And Manchin's kind of in the same vein, but he's just like, I don't know, that number's too big. And it's just, you know, what does that mean, man? Like, I'm sorry, that's how much these programs are going to cost. So, I, I truly don't understand that. And then when you break it down, you know, this amount of money, it's not going to be spent all at once. And I think that's what people also have, you know, a, either purposefully um, ignored that message or it just hasn't gotten out there. This is going to be spent over 10 years. And, you know, you compare that to look like the Pentagon budget and things like that. You know, it's very minuscule. So it, it, but people it, get scared is, by these big numbers. And Joe Manchin knows that. So there we are. It, that is that is a really an excellent point that. I don't understand why 
um, you know, d- d- Democrats in the Senate have allowed themselves to be defined by that that three point five trillion dollar number, right? Because y- you could very easily say it's a three hundred and fifty billion dollar number, right? Like I I I don't understand which is what you would want to do in order to compare it to other yearly line items, like as you point out, the defense budget. Um, it it so I love that I love that point. I I also think. At the end of the day, you were talking about incredibly arbitrary cost columns where what shows up in the benefit column, right, takes time to mature, right? Rebuilding infrastructure allows better paying jobs to migrate out to areas that are currently not well serviced, right? Um that shows up in our GDP. That shows up in improving the lives of people who, ironically enough, will probably turn around and vote Republican. Um, you know, what's how does that balance out the costs? Um, I, it, it, it seems odd to suggest that that you, you get zero credit for that. So all of that, I, I agree with you. Well, point. But but. But I think I think Manchin is going to surprise us. I think uh, I think the number that comes in is is going to be higher uh, than than where he said his absolute line is right now. So second issue, CNN is saying that Manchin absolutely is going to hold the line, is going to block any Medicare expansion. Yep. <laughs> I think the next version of our recon I think the version that passes out of reconciliation is going to have some kind of meaningful right like I, I not 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 garbage some kind of meaningful medicare expansion i think he's going to give on that too yeah i'm going to take the under on that one too <laughs> all right all right all right the third thing this is the big one i think mansion is going to sign onto some form of billionaire surtax. This is really the definitive issue of the Democratic Party right now. That is, does, you know, do ultra billionaires have to pay anything or do they not? Right. I don't know if this is going to be, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the most basic would be just rolling back the 2017 Trump giveaways, uh, which, you know, did nothing for the economy. Um, some proposals are things like the corporate minimum tax. Um, there is... You know, my girlfriend, Liz Warren's wealth tax. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. No, I did. OK, we could. I don't know what it's going to be. It probably won't be the Warren plan. Um, sad as that makes me. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to get something. Yeah. Or it's going to be something that's so watered down that it's meaningless, which is why I think that you're dreaming and the reality <laughs> of that. <laughs> all right. All right. So let's track those three things together as we continue to watch the infrastructure bill. Right. Fair. And and look, I get it. We're not going to get everything we want. Not so long as the swing votes are mansion and cinema. Uh, so let's get to work primarying cinema, electing more Democrats and making the swing vote. I don't know, Tammy Baldwin or something. Right. Like until we do that, we're going to get we're going to be stuck in this position. But but I think at the end of the day, we're going to get a lot more than we expected out of reconciliation, despite the public hand wringing for months uh, and the highly vocal opposition of Manchin to date. You'll have to have me back on so that I can gloat and you can grovel when you go 0 and 3. And I am counting way watered down bills as me being right. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, we've got we've set the terms. Uh, absolutely. Have you back on. Uh, and uh, and speaking of, we will be right back with the B segment. Hi there, Diana Erickson here, host of the podcast One Sweet Dream, which is a podcast that shines new light on the Beatles, illuminating their story in ways not seen before. This podcast does deep storytelling to get to radical new ideas and insights that transform our understanding of their story. We've always known the Beatles story was exciting and epic, but there is an even bigger, better, sexier, and more beautiful story that's been hiding in plain sight. And that's what I want to share with you. Historians say that it takes about 50 years to tell the story of an event properly. And so here we are, a little over 50 years later, and have I got a great story to tell. So I hope you'll join us at Once We Dream Podcast, where we explore the dream that was and is the Beatles. 
Episodes will be released every Tuesday and Friday, so please subscribe to One Sweet Dream wherever you listen to podcasts. So, uh, let's get into the B segment. There is a Rolling Stone article by Hunter Walker alleging what we kind of all knew was true, which is that multiple members of Congress were intimately involved with Trump's efforts to overturn the election and the January 6th insurrection. Three anonymous sources have come forward to the January 6th commission, and two of them spoke with Rolling Stone. Yeah, um, this is fantastic reporting. Uh, obviously, we were going to talk about this this week. Um, this confirms and builds on um, the, the way you put it, right? Like what, what matches up with our intuition, what we already know, because uh, we saw it with our own eyes um, and, and really illustrates the significance of. Uh, of this January 6th House Commission, right? We saw people like Paul Gosar, Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene um, publicly trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election. So look, like we knew they were sympathetic no matter what. Uh, they denied being specifically involved, uh, but this report shed some light on uh, just how extensive that involvement actually was. Yes. So the two anonymous sources were apparently involved with organizing and planning the protests that happened before the Capitol insurrection. And they'd actually helped organize and plan a series of demonstrations that took place in multiple states around the country in the weeks before the election, the idea being to persuade more sympathetic senators. They have said that multiple people associated with the March for Trump and Stop the Steal were in communication with certain members of Congress. Yeah. And uh, and these are your usual suspects, right? No one is going to be shocked, uh, but it's worth repeating the names. Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, Lauren Boebert from Colorado, Mo Brooks, named in a lawsuit from Alabama, Madison Cawthorn, uh, illiterate Madison Cawthorn from North Carolina, Andy Biggs from Arizona, and of course, old favorite Louis Gohmert from Texas. Um, they... We're in, uh, again, according to these anonymous sources, communication, constant communication with the organizing and planning groups and specifically with these three organizers. Um, Rolling Stone confirmed that these two sources were in communication with Gosar and Bobert on January 6th. Now, I, I don't know what form that confirmation looks like, but again, right, this is investigative journalism so you, you know you have to think uh that they have seen uh you know an email a text message a uh, a phone log something like that yes and the reason they didn't specify what those communications were were in order to preserve the anonymity of these sources oh yeah i did i am not that that's an excellent point right like and and we have an ongoing investigation uh that could potentially lead to criminal referrals yeah you don't you do not want to threaten that i i i just want to make it clear for the record as you read this that th this is more than just you know somebody said oh yeah i i can call lauren bobert whenever i want Yes. So one of the wildest parts here in this <laughs> article was that Representative Gosar, you know, our favorite treasonous dentist, uh, dangled a blanket pardon for these sources for an unrelated ongoing investigation that these sources were involved in. Uh, no specifics on what that was, but it was to encourage them to plan these protests. They received several assurances about this pardon, and Gosar even said, Quote, I was just going over the list of pardons, and we all just wanted to tell you guys how much we appreciate all the hard work you've been doing. And I assume that was followed by the world's largest wink. I, all the hard work you've been doing that requires a pardon, that means crimes, right? Like, you don't, that, 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 I appreciate all the hard work you do for me, Morgan, but I don't have to dangle a pardon in front of you because, you know, it's not illegal, wink. Um. Uh, anyway, yeah, no, it, that that was that was a terrifying read in the article. Uh, one of them said that, quote, our impression was that it that meaning the pardon was a done deal that he'd spoken to the president in the Oval Office in, in a meeting about pardons and that our names came up. Oh, oh, you sweet summer child that uh, co continuing to, to quote the anonymous source. They were working on submitting the paperwork and getting the members of the House Freedom Caucus to sign on as a show of support. Uh, so that that ends that quote, which, you know, 
<laughs> it first uh, seems to me like a very clear, uh, hey, help us sow this narrative. And in exchange, you get a pardon. Um, familiar story with the Trump administration. Uh, but but Morgan, did, did they actually receive this pardon? He asked, expecting the answer. No. So it looks like they did not, as is also typical of the Trump administration. They screwed the guys over after they did work for them. Um, again, yeah. a tale as old as time. So these two sources say they would have done this with or without the pardon, but they were upset that it did not materialize. Uh, I did. Uh, again, I, I upset. Yeah, I'd be upset, too. Like uh, the the primary consideration that was promised to me. But, you know, no, I'm just. I am so far down the rabbit hole that I'm happy I did it anyway. Anyway, I don't feel bad for them for a moment, right? Um, Gosar being involved here uh, did not surprise me because uh, his chief of staff, Thomas Van Flyn, is named in the committees, the 1-6 committee's request, seeking documents and communications. Yes, and this is not even the only congressional staffer who appears in the story. Nick Dyer, Green's communication director, says Marjorie Taylor Green was solely involved in the objection to the Electoral College certification. So I love that response. <laughs> no, she was not involved in the overtly violent overthrow of the government. She was involved in just the procedural part of the violent coup, as if that makes it better. Uh, yeah, and, and we could do a show on the false equivalency because you you know i mean the the second dyer mentioned he was going to say well you know maxine waters tried to impeach trump and you know there were there were previous uh democratic vote protest votes in 2000 to, and, and, and none of that is the equivalent to what these folks did we have, we've talked about this on this show uh we have the john eastman memo uh that lays out a plan for insurrection that begins with that procedural work objecting to the certification of electors from seven different states right so so this is not like any other event in history um uh dyer also trotted out all of the other like well you know who could possibly care about uh insurrectionists when you're paying three bucks a gallon for gas and you know soldiers in afghanistan were killed and you know children are being forced to wear masks and our border is under assault from i bless i uh, you know the typical lunatic right response oh yeah the um i forget who which uh, republican it was but they said that you know a bunch of immigrants were coming over from brazil wearing gucci bags <sighs> which i was well. like i'm not mad if bad bitches want to come into our country <laughs> I would like bad bitch Brazilians. That'd be that'd be good for me. But um yeah, I yeah, and then their idea that, you know, the the gas the president has a magic switch that changes the gas prices. But um but yeah, I think that Dyer is being very telling here. And I think this is telling because this is the GOP strategy to counter the January 6th commission narratively. It is to say, oh, well, no one cares about that. We have other things to worry about, even if those things that we are worrying about are fake or are things that they don't actually care about, right? They mentioned, you know, over 13 soldiers killed in Afghanistan. I'm like, oh, nice for you to trot that one out again. I thought y'all were over that. Um and I think they, they are counting on that. They're counting on this gaslighting that they've been doing since January 6th to work for people to say, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. They didn't actually hang Mike Pence. And, you know, oh, no, gas is high. But, you know, I'm going to complain about it when gas is low because my husband works on an oil rig and, you know, he's not making so much money anymore. But when they're high, it's, oh, I can't afford to fill up my Chevy Tahoe. Right. And, you know, but, but counting on people not being able to, you know, keep track of that, um, that narrative. Right. And then it's going to be, oh, kids, you know, they're having to wear masks. And it's like, yeah, well, they're having to wear masks because adults like you are refusing to get vaccinated. So, you know, they, they trot these narratives out. And I've noticed it also lines up what I think is going to be, you know, the GOP midterm messaging, which is all going to be, you know, culture war bullshit. Right. But I do think they are counting on people also just not caring about finding out what happened on January 6th anymore. I that last part is to me sort of the most terrifying consequence, long term consequence uh, of the Trump administration, because, you know, I, I have had multiple professionals, right, are. Uh, people adjacent to our clients uh, who have said to me like, well, you know, uh, it's really I can't really vote on, you know, whether Trump 
uh, you know, broke the laws by uh, encouraging foreign leaders to intervene uh, and say untrue things in order to help him win reelection. Like what I really care about is, you know, the policy on taxes and the like. And, and like it, 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 it did not used to be that way. Right. Like, again, we have the precedent of Richard Nixon in living memory uh, as, a, as a counterweight that, you know, people used to want more out of the White House. Anyway, um, another figure, I, 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 I believe people do care. It's, you know, why we do these shows. But um, another figure that is uh, definitely prevalent uh, in the January 6th insurrection is Ali Alexander. Uh, so sources now say that Alexander just could not help but tell on himself when he said in a now deleted live stream that Gosar, Brooks and Biggs all helped him organize the wild protest event. I was the person who came up with the January 6th idea with Congressman Gosar, Congressman Mo Brooks and Congressman Andy Biggs. That's that's what Alexander said on the live stream at the top. We four schemed up. Schemed is the word he used. By we four schemed up on putting maximum pressure on Congress while they were voting, so that who we couldn't lobby, we could change hearts and the minds of Republicans who were in that body, hearing our loud roar from outside. End of real quote. And you know, threatening to kill them is one way to change hearts and minds, and also letting them know that if they wanted to overthrow the government procedurally, and then had some muscle behind it, I. I, that that's that's treason sorry yeah and i love how it's like no one asked it's like that that meme that's like nobody literally no one ali alexander yeah i plotted this with these four congressmen and it's like jesus no one no one made you say that but all right man I, and yeah you can see why he deleted that right so um some other names also come up that might be familiar to us uh the two sources tell the rolling tell rolling stone that trump chief of staff mark meadows was very familiar with um with them and the planning of the protests concerns about the potential for violence at ali alexander's protests were actually raised to mark meadows and that meadows was a regular figure and even these really tiny groups of national organizers these meetings wow so in fact kylie kremer the executive director of women for america first allegedly bragged even that she was going to go meet meadows right before the rally on january 6th yeah so as we are trying to sort of trace these these threads, Mark Meadows is a key White House liaison here between the organizers and the White House. Uh, there is also Katrina Pearson, a familiar face over the last four years. Both of the anonymous sources describe Katrina Pearson, who worked for the Trump campaign in 2016 and 2020 as a key liaison. She was the national spokesperson for the Trump campaign in 2016. They describe her as their, quote, go to girl, end of quote. We love to be a go to girl. Um <laughs> Prior to this, she primaried actually Pete Sessions in Texas back in 2014, and she was endorsed by Sarah Palin. So, you know, huh. uh, there's that. I'm sure she's a gem. And then she attended a meeting for Tea Party activists in Myrtle Beach with Ted Cruz, which sounds like a nightmare. Oh. All, and no, nothing in that sentence is good. Uh, I can say that because I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. So there's a lot of yikes <laughs> in that sentence. Um, she met with Trump while she was in Myrtle Beach and he hired her. And she herself has kind of a dark and tragic past, but she also seems to be a very dark and shady person herself. Ugh, I These these folks keep popping up. So uh, these sources definitely help support what, you know, again, we all kind of already knew to, to be the case. So next, the sources say that they are willing to testify and they have been in informal communication with the January 6th commission. Um, why don't you break down that uh, informal for us? Yeah, they don't really go into it, but they just say that basically they've been in communication. Right. And I yeah. think that they and they've turned over, I believe, like any kind of documentary evidence or thing, you know, things that they've revealed to the Rolling to Rolling Stone are probably the same documents that I imagine they probably turned over to the January 6th commission. Right. Um, and we I think we do need to push back on these sources just a little bit, you know, not, you yeah. know, take what they say with a little bit of a grain of salt because they do. And the article even points this out. Right. That they paint themselves in a very generous light. 
of course, yeah. which I mean, it, you know, whether intentionally or not, but they say, you know, oh, we were never part of any kind of planning or organizing for the Ali Alexander protest or the insurrection at the Capitol. You know, they didn't know it was going to turn out to be violent. And again, it goes back to the, well, you should have known kind of thing, because they even bring this up about Mark Meadows, like, oh my goodness, we couldn't believe Mark Meadows didn't act when he should have known. And I also have that same question, like, okay, but what about you? Like, if Mark Meadows should have known, like, shouldn't right. you have? It seems right. like you had yeah. access to the same exact information. But it does seem like we do have, you know, a Venn diagram of those events, because I know that people like Marjorie Taylor Greene have been, you know, saying the things as we talked about. Oh, well, I wasn't part of a violent running through the Capitol insurrection. I was part of a procedural insurrection, right? And so, you know, you guys are lying when you say I've tried to overthrow the government. But it does seem yeah. like we do have a Venn diagram of these, right, where we do have people that, you know, because I doubt that everyone knew everything about, you know, oh, we're going to run in there with zip ties and do God knows what to AOC, right? Um, but, you know, there's people that did definitely know, or at least they should have known that it would get violent. Or maybe they did not plan that part, but planned, you know, the procedural part. And then, you know, what did they know about the violent parts? But you know, and I imagine there's a lot of people that, you know, maybe they didn't give them, you know, the blueprints of a capital, but just kind of like hoped it would get violent. And, you know, then you can wash your hands of it and say, oh, well, you know, I just it just so happened to work out that way. Yeah, I I mean, this is this is sort of an, a, a sidebar to that, but I can't help thinking about like what a what a masterful job uh, that uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin did during the second impeachment uh, in laying out just the months and months of violent rhetoric uh, and extremist rhetoric that came out of the White House and out of official sources to sort of prime the pump. Right. Like you you cannot tell people for six months from the person they revere as a God King. Hey, they are stealing your precious rights. This is terrible. This is the worst thing ever. They are doing this to you and, 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 and not right. I mean, you're, you're poking a frothing dog. So anyway, uh, both of these anonymous sources say that they had discussed with other organizers, Trump allies and members of Congress. Um, what, what, what they had discussed was a rally that would solely take place at the Ellipse, where speakers, including the former president, who, by the way, did speak there, would present evidence <laughs> about issues with the election. This demonstration would take place in conjunction with objections that were being made by Trump allies during the certification on the House floor that day. Uh, and uh, and they insist that the Capitol was never in play. Right. Again, it was about the, you know, making look and saying, oh, this is what the American people want. This is, you know, making it appear that procedural part of it, the, insur the insurrection, you know, appear legitimate. And a senior staffer for a Republican member of Congress that who was also granted anonymity to discuss the ongoing investigation. So no idea who he works for. Um, but he says that they believed the events would only involve supporting objections on the House floor, which, again, you're telling on yourself. So I only supported the, you know, civil part of it, I guess. The staffer says their member was engaged in planning that was, quote, specifically and fully above board. A whole host of people let this go a totally different way, the senior Republican staffer says. And again, quote, they fucked it up for a lot of people who were planning to present evidence on the House floor. We were pissed off at everything that happened. <laughs> yeah, which is not unbelievable to me, right? Because again, that kind of ruins your, I can see where that does throw a wrench in your narrative like, oh, well, this was all civil. But I think that there, again, this ha there has been this attempt to divorce this procedural, you know, let's overturn democracy with the one weird trick insurrection from the let's go run into the Capitol and grab Congress members, right? So, and again, the willingness of Republicans to say they supported not certifying the election, even though they're not saying that they were a part of the violent insurrection of the Capitol, shows that, right? That they they do recognize that there there is this wiggle room between those. So they're saying, you know, oh no, we're not part of the running into the Capitol. We were the ones overturning democracy for one weird trick, but they're normalizing <laughs> that, right? That that's fine because in comparison, right? I, I think that is exactly right. There is this normalization of the procedural insurrection, as you're calling it, in which they were going to overturn democracy. Right. It, it, it 
from a, from a from a legal perspective, from a philosophical perspective, it, it does not matter that you are hiding behind a decertification vote and subsequent implementation, right? That 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 is the same as running into the White House with a with a pitchfork and hoping to, you know, hang Mike Pence, right? Like it it's it 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 legally does not make a difference. Exactly. And I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, the January 6th Capitol insurrection wasn't bad or anything like that. Of course it was. It was awful. And we do need to that's why we also do need to get to the bottom of that. But the, but there is this other part to it, this more civil and more dressed up insurrection that we're talking about. Right. And we have to have the idea that both were insurrections. And, you yeah. know, we don't just have to have Marjorie Taylor Greene literally leading a charge through the Capitol, screaming, hang Mike Pence, you know, on her way to go again, lead people to AOC. So, yeah, it's it's insane that we're, you know, make, making it seem as if MTG, you know, she ha- she has to d- take those actions in order to be Im- you know, implicated in this insurrection. And also, maybe she did have something to do with the violence there. Again, we don't know. But yeah, the yeah. people who did plan to overturn democracy, quote, the proper and legal way are, yeah, just as dangerous. Because as you can see, if that had happened, then it would not be, see- that would not, and say there was no storming of the Capitol, right? That they could see, you could see where it would be painted as, oh, this was an insurrection. It would be seen as legal and normal and very cool. Because after all, nobody was killed, right? We didn't, you know, we, we did this a proper and procedural way. And I see why the people who only knew or planned for procedural insurrection at least that were unaware of the Ali Alexander planning would be ticked off because now they're paired with people who went into the Capitol to go kill AOC, right? And this yeah. damages that normalization of overturning democracy with these cute little procedures and one weird tricks, right? But I think that they have been very good at finding that, you know, dividing line that people seem to have about the differences between those two things. Which, again, we do know that somebody was in the Capitol also helping the violent insurrectionists, right? We have the things like we know Ilhan Omar, her panic button was tampered with, right? And we still right. don't have answers about that. We know AOC has said things like, I do not trust the people who are, you know, working, not, I do not trust everybody who works for the Capitol. I do not trust some of my colleagues and understandably why, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it. I, I really love the way you 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 put all of that together. I am stunned that the reaction from the right to the release of the John Eastman memo has mostly been a collective yawn, right? It it to me that is the public facing piece of the procedural insurrection and it is every bit it concedes, right, that it is without legal support. Uh, as the the armed piece, and it does not take much to put together when when your procedural piece says, well, maybe we can do this and maybe we can do that. Well, well, I mean, when your when your game plan has a bunch of maybes in it, usually you fill up those maybes with other contingencies, right? To me, it does not take much to look at that and go, yeah, if you're serious about this, if you're going down that path, and we know they were because we have the phone calls from the White House to members of the U.S. Senate who then procedurally objected to the certification of electors. Right. Like that didn't like Ted Cruz didn't just show up one day and think like, hmm, Arizona's votes seem weird. Right? Like this was this was orchestrated. So in my view, the challenging is the the. The, the work that needs to be done, what, what's what's going to be difficult uh, to put the pieces together for the January 6th commission is going to be figuring out exactly which staffers, which members of Congress and which White House officials knew about which parts and then weaving that all together into one coherent narrative uh, and presenting that out to the public. And, you know, God help me, like. I, I'm really glad Liz Cheney is on that commission. You know, like I am really glad they have a conservative Wyoming, you know, a daughter of the what used to be the most hated Republican in America in Dick Cheney. And like, let's not forget, he's still an evil war criminal. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad she will be there to sort of double check against like people looking back and going like, 
that this is really bad. Like Liz, like this is real bad, isn't it? Um, so that's that. It's going to be hard work, but um, you know, that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I think um, I think that's right, and I think it's important that people not let up and you know um, allow this narrative of like, oh, nobody cares about what happened on January six to you know yeah. take hold. So we will be following the developments with the commission as they come. And after the break, we will be back with comings and goings. Bathroom from hell. It was like every time I cleaned it, 10 minutes later, it was dirty again. Then I heard about Bathroom Monkey. They said the Bathroom Monkey system would keep my entire bathroom clean for up to eight whole months. They were right. The little monkey air freshener releases a clean, fresh scent and emits a piercing, ultra-high frequency shriek, scientifically designed to keep my bathroom monkey hard at work 24 hours a day. Now my bathroom's monkey clean and monkey fresh. And my bathroom monkey? He's more than a bathroom cleanser. He's a part of the family. I don't know where monkeys come from. I don't know how they reproduce. I don't know what they eat. But I do know one thing. They were born to clean bathrooms. And when its cleaning power is all used up, simply pick up another in any of three decorator colors. Red, blue, or orangutan. <laughs> this little guy just started today. But you know, I think my new bathroom monkey and I are going to make a great team. All right. Uh, just a quick segment here. Uh, President Biden uh, this week announced his intent to nominate the following individuals to serve in key roles in his administration, continuing kind of the slow, steady process of refilling the executive branch. Um, Beth Van Schack is the nominee for ambassador at large for global criminal justice at the State Department. Uh, Michelle Taylor, who will be the nominee for the U.S. representative to the U.N. Human Rights Council. And Martha Williams, the nominee for director of Fish and Wildlife Services over at the Department of the Interior. Yeah, and the person who really caught my eye here is Beth Van Schack. She's a professor at Stanford where she teaches international human rights, international criminal law, and human trafficking, among other subjects. And she has also been the acting director of the Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. She's also a faculty fellow with Stanford Center for Human Rights and International Justice. Yeah. And and before we elected a criminally insane game show host and drove her out of government service and back into academia, Van Schack was deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues back in the Office of Global Criminal Justice at the Department of State. That's right. Her duties there were to advise the Secretary of State and the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights on the formulation of U.S. policy regarding the prevention of and accountability for mass atrocities, such as war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. So, you know, a, a lot of important stuff there. Yeah. And I'm glad that we've started hiring people who are against that again, as opposed to, you know, John Yu. Um, and of course, this continues Biden's really unbroken streak of proving that, yes, there are highly qualified, well-credentialed women out there who are perfectly capable of serving in frontline roles in the administration. Van Schack, you know, I, the only blemish in her sterling career is that, you know, she was a Yale Law School grad. So, you know, second place. We all know Ole Miss Law is the most superior <laughs> law school. So I agree. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Morgan, thank you so much. I th I, that was uh, really great work kind of breaking down the uh, all the different threads uh, in the ongoing one six investigation. And uh, and thanks, as always, for uh, for filling in. All right. Thanks for having me. Can't wait to be back on again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got you've got some bets to lose. So. I do. Or when. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Until next week. Bye bye. Bye. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com.
They might be giants that have been on the road for too long. Too long. And they might be giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now they might be giants are playing their breakthrough album, Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. This ad was paid for with somebody else's money.